I say, my name's Andy Hollington, and the CEO of the Square Meter Group. Um, some of you know me already, some of you don't. Uh, we're a training consultancy company, and we deliver uh, training courses around the world um, from sort of level one for event volunteers all the way up to sort of level five crowd safety managers. Um, so it's, um, we've, we've been doing that since about 2014 now. What we wanted to do in, during the current situation, um, everyone is hungry for for knowledge, it seems at the moment. So we're running a series of webinars so that um, we can provide you with some free learning. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy them. Uh, we're getting some really good feedback from the series we've done already, and we have a number left to release as well. Um, so just before we start, I'm gonna go through a few of the features for you. Some of you haven't used Zoom before. Okay, at the bottom of the screen, um, you will have a button that says Q&A. Okay, the Q&A box is what we're going to use for questions throughout this webinar. So the format will be, um, John will speak for an hour and then we will spend half an hour, 40 minutes um, answering questions. So the way to get your question answered is to type those into the Q&A box. When you type a question, I think there's one in, there's a, a message in there at the moment from Walter. So if you, if you go into your chat box and have a look, you'll see a thumbs up just underneath it. Uh, that thumbs up um, will allow you to promote the question. So if you see a question that you really like, that want to hear the answer to, click the thumbs up and that will move that to the top of the list. We will try to get as many answered as possible, um, but um, we, we may run out of time. So if you just keep promoting them and we'll answer the, the top ones, I mean, we will try and get all the answers back to you. Okay, so the other um, buttons at the bottom, um, you might see the chat function, which I think most of you have already found as well. Um, so yeah, everyone seems to be using the chat button. If you have any issues um, with sound or anything like that, please feel free to send me a message using the chat function. It makes it a bit more interactive. We'll have various um, polls starting, um, which you can just answer if, if you want to. Um, slides, John, will these be, slides be available afterwards for people in sort of PDF format? Yeah. Okay, so we can get them out to you. Copies of the webinar will be available on YouTube as well. Um, so we will send out through our mailing list and how to access those. Okay, so just so you've seen the polls and you know it works, I'm just going to launch one now if you'd like to just have a look so you can see that working. You can vote. Wow, you all, you all seem to know how to use that quite well. Okay, so we're going to get started. I'm going to go and try and help some of the people get in. So I'm going to hand over and introduce you to Professor John Drury from the University of Sussex, um, who's going to talk to you about using crowd psychology. Uh, really interesting talk and um, hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to start posting your questions, folks, and enjoy. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. I suppose one positive thing to come out of the current crisis is the opportunity we have to run events like this and involve many more people than we would normally. Um, when I normally do an event like this, a talk like this, it's normally to uh, a much smaller group, maybe 30, 40, 50, 100, not, um, not 100, 200 at a time. So um, let me first say um, a few words about who I am. Um, and maybe who you are. Um, so I am a psychologist, I'm an academic. I've been carrying out research on crowds, uh, crowd behavior for uh, over 30 years. Um, and halfway through my academic career as a researcher, I started working with practitioners 
including people in the events industry, people in emergency response, the emergency services, um, and, and so on. And this uh, webinar is aimed at event safety professionals. I know there's uh, been some interest in this webinar uh, from different people as well. I, I guess there are some others who are not in the industry who are here, other scientists, perhaps students. But what I'm going to say is focus on the needs and the interests of people who work in the industry um, with uh, the, 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 the research that is most useful, I think, to this group of people. So let me say a word about why, uh, why psychology? Uh, why might you need psychology in your work? Well, my argument here is that you're already using psychology, right? Whether you realize it or not, you use psychology in your decisions, in your judgments, in your management techniques and strategies. Because there's lots of implicit theories out there in popular culture and common sense. And when you make a judgment about how the people attending your event think, how they feel, how they behave, how they're going to respond partic uh, to particular management strategies, to particular ways of organizing the event. You're making psychological assumptions and many of them, of course, are about how people behave in groups. And um, there are many different ways of thinking about groups, many different psychologies out there. If you think of popular representations, kind of lay theories of groups, there are ones that you see all the time that you might be uh, critical of when you see them in the mass media, like the mob mentality and, and mass panic and so on, but many more assumptions that you will make when you, uh, when you uh, carry out your events and you plan for your events, you make assumptions about human behavior. So there are different theories that are available and some theories of how people behave have a much better evidence base than others. Some of them haven't got any evidence base at all. They are kind of popular prejudices, if you like. So the reason for bringing a bit more academic psychology into event safety management into the industry is that we believe that the more you know about group psychology and the latest research, the better you'll be able to uh, understand why the things you do work well, because of course most of the things you do work well and you might want to understand why that is so you can do them more and also some of the things that don't go so well, why is it that they don't go so well? So that's what I'll be doing, I'll be giving you some principles also some some ideas some recommendations on using psychology in your work so this presentation this webinar is, is organized into three parts so first of all i'm going to tell you about some basic uh group psychology introduce you to some some core principles and these core principles are known as the social identity approach in psychology social identity approach then I'm going to uh, show you how some of these ideas apply in the way that people behave in emergencies. I'm going to just describe some evidence to you of how people behave in emergencies. And then finally, I shall uh, draw out from the research, draw out from the evidence, um, some recommendations. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole load of them that we work on. We've worked on that we've used with practitioners and policymakers before. So I'm going to present you with a sample of uh, the recommendations that we make that um, will help you in your work. And these recommendations are focused on communication strategies. So let's talk about basic group psychology. And I want us to, first of all, think of a group, think of any group. What group comes to mind? Now, when I began this uh, webinar, I said who I was and who you are. And I'm not only me, John, the individual. I also said I'm a psychologist. I'm a member of a category. I'm a group member. 
I'm an academic, I'm a psychologist. And I talked about you in the same way. I said you were, or most of the people attending this event, this webinar, are industry people, they're event safety professionals, crowd safety managers, different ways of talking, but you're members of a group. And I said there are other people here, members of other groups perhaps, uh, other scientists perhaps. So we're not only individuals, I'm not only John, I'm a member of a category. And the first point I want to make about groups is that our group memberships are, are important to us. I care about my, my group membership as you care about being an event safety professional. So the first point is our groups are important to us. But the second point is we're members of lots of different groups. And which group, which category is important to us at a particular time, is salient to us at a particular time, varies and changes depending on the conditions. So in one context and at one level, I'm in a different group from most of the people in this webinar. I'm a psychologist, I'm in that group. You're in the event safety professionals group. But at another level, we're all in the same group, right? I mean, at a trivial level, we're all the, we're, we're the people in this webinar. But at, deep, at a deeper level, both me as a psychologist, you as event safety professionals, industry people, the other scientists here, we're all part of a community, the crown safety community. And you can see the kind of group level behavior when you see interactions, for example, on, on Twitter or face to face. You see that at one level, we're different, but at another level, we are, we are the same group. And as I say, that changes from context to context. And that's going to be an important uh, principle for you to use in your work. So now I want to say, um, tell you some of the things we've, we've learned about groups, about group processes from many years of research. Um, so this is not true of all groups, but it's true uh, of many groups and on most occasions. <clears throat> and the first uh, uh, feature of groups is that when people are part of the same group, see each other as part of the same group, they're more likely to trust each other. And trusting each other means um, two things. It means that they're more likely to listen to each other. But it also means they're more likely to believe each other. When people are in the same group, they're also more likely to influence each other. So when somebody listens to somebody else and that person recommends an action, that action is more likely to be taken up. Uh, you, you take an action, that action is more likely to be copied or used as an example of how to behave. And thirdly, people are, when they're in the same group, they're more likely to feel or believe that they share the same goals with each other. But it's more than a belief because people, when they assume that the other has the same goal, um, they try to align. So I assume that everybody in this webinar is here because they want to uh, enhance the uh, use psychology to enhance safety in their in their in their work. So we share those goals and we try to align our goals uh, if we if we're in the same group. Some more. Um, if people are in the same group, they're more likely to expect support from each other. So if I'm at an event and I get into trouble, I would expect you if you're in my group to support me, to back me up morally, materially, physically, to be on my side. I expect that. Um, and that means that when people are in the same group, they feel safer together, they feel stronger together. And more, when people are in the same group, they're more likely to help each other. So that belief I have that you'll come to my aid is right because you will come to my aid because you're motivated that you see me as one of us right and you care about what happens to me um, now when we when you put some of these elements together that people are more likely to help they're more likely to uh, coordinate goals they expect support then that means that people are more likely 
when they're in the same group, to act as one, to act as a body, to act as a unity, right? Now, as I said, these, these, aren't, these uh, features aren't true of every group, but they're true enough and common enough for, to be useful to you as working assumptions about the kinds of groups that you usually work with. Now, let me say what the, the psychological mechanism is. Because when this happens, when these conditions occur, that people see each other in the same group, we have a name for that, <coughs> which is shared social identity. And shared social identity means two things. The first thing it means is that I identify with this group, that I see um, other people um, as, as me, as, as a we. And so I will define myself as part of the, the crowd safety community, for example. So that's the fir first part, my identification with the group. The second part is that I see you as members of the crowd safety community. So I'm a member of the group, you're a member of the group, therefore we've got shared social identity between us. Now, just to show you uh, briefly that this matters um, in your work, think of the behaviours that you want in members of the public, right? When your event goes well, your event is safe, your event is trouble free, um, or you have an emergency evacuation that goes as it should do, that everyone gets out in time. What kinds of behaviours would you want from the public right you would want them to coordinate with each other in an orderly way you'd want them to when they're in a queue to uh to cooperate with each other um and with you um you'd also want them and this is particularly in relation to your relationship with the members of the public you want them to listen to what you say so when there's any instructions, any guidance, any public information, you want them to listen to that, to trust it, to accept it, and to comply with it. And if there is an emergency event, you want people to act with urgency, not with complacency, not with excessive anxiety, but with sufficient uh, urgency and motivation to act. So you want people acting as one. You want them coordinating. You don't want them pushing, shoving, competing, or going for the door at once. You want that that level of collective coordination. Now, the key point here is that all these behaviours I've mentioned are much more likely to occur if the public are in the same group as each other, they see themselves as a group with each other, and they see themselves as a group with you. Therefore, the key question for you is how do you get the public to share identity with you to enhance safety at your events. So that is the key question. And before I give you the answer to that, or some answers to that, um, I want to talk about how people behave in emergencies um, because it's a uh, vivid illustration of the usefulness of the group psychology approach to events in which sometimes people say that the public, the group, is the problem. I'm going to seek to persuade you uh, that the opposite is the case. So how do people behave in emergencies? Well, sometimes people say, we know the answer to that, right? We don't need uh, academic psychologists to tell us. We know the answer to how, to the question of how people behave in emergencies. So they panic, they overreact, they're selfish, they're irrational. That's what we know, don't we? Um, before I talk to you about the evidence, I want to say a few words about why in my work, and I suggest in your work too, the concept of panic is not actually very, a very useful one, right? Because in fact, the concept of panic, that people are overreacting, is a subjective judgment rather than a description of behaviour. Because how do you know when it's an overreaction? If you think about where the concept of panic sits clinically, panic disorder 
is a clinical condition where somebody has fear out of proportion to reality. They get anxious for no reason. Okay. And so you can compare their anxiety with reality and you say, well, it's an overreaction, therefore it's panic. But you can't do the same thing in an emergency. You can't because there are so many unknowns. There is so much missing information. How can you tell? How can you measure whether a fear reaction and the flight is an overreaction? I mean, there was a parallel with uh, some of the comments made about some of the buying behavior we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, of course, because it was characterized as panic buying. And just some statistics, first of all, it's worth noting that no more than 10% of people were actually buying more than they would normally. And one of the reasons that the shelves were seen to clear so quickly was because of the just-in-time logistics system, which meant that firms don't have a lot of stuff in their warehouses. But even if you uh, put that aside and say, well, look at what people are doing and feeling, when people bought more stuff than normal, by what criteria is that an overreaction? I mean, if they think they're going to be stuck at home for a while, how much extra toilet paper should they get? Now, it's a difficult judgment. Um, and therefore, I would suggest we put aside that judgment and we talk instead about the behaviour. So if you want to talk about maladaptive behaviour in emergencies, let's talk about pushing, let's talk about competing instead, because that is something measurable and objective. So, um, nevertheless, you know, I have to acknowledge that in, uh, in academic research, researchers do talk about the word panic, and usually, again, they do mean pushing and shoving individualism. So let me just give you a quick overview of the research, and these are just three three nice examples which illustrate the point. The first is Yanis's work on uh, atomic bombing during, of, the, of Japan during World War II, and he concluded that there wasn't much evidence of, of panic. People didn't react with panic. Then there was Ian Donald and David Cantor's study of the King's Cross Underground fire in 1987, in which 31 people died. And they said, panic wasn't the reason that people died. There wasn't much evidence of panic. People were, thinking about what they were doing they were they were using scripts they were using the wrong exits that's why they died and they were using familiar exits they weren't panicking and then there is the most um, well-researched disaster of all time perhaps until now we're going to be swamped with studies on 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 covid19 now but until now it's been the the 911 world trade center evacuation and a massive study led by ed gallia and others again concluded that panic was evident in less than 0.01% of cases. So again, it wasn't a crowd thing. Um, and again, people weren't on the whole behaving selfishly, overreacting and so on. So pushing and shoving, this kind of disorderly exit is rare, but let's talk about when it does occur, because you, know, you probably do want to know, you probably have got examples yourself of where an evacuation went badly, and you want to know why. So let's talk about that. There was a great study carried out uh, about 20 years ago now by a couple of psychologists, North American psychologists, um, Chirkov, Chirkov and Kashigian, and they carried out detailed comparisons of a number of evacuations that have gone very well and a number of evacuations that have gone badly. And uh, included in that were things like the Coconut Grove fire, the notorious Coconut Grove fire, in which hundreds of people died, and the World Trade Center evacuation of 1993. And they concluded that you were more likely to get pushing and shoving and competition and less of that coordination that we want in evacuations in uh, locations where there was a very narrow exit and people were unfamiliar with that exit which probably tells you something about the need, for, the need for drills. In our own research, we've looked at the psychological conditions for pushing and competing, right? And I hope you can work out from what I'm gonna say that the pushing and shoving, the competition, the inefficient, collectively inefficient evacuation is more likely in those conditions where people don't have a shared social identity. 
And uh, so this is a, obviously it's a very difficult um, topic to investigate. And one of the tools we've used, I mean, we, uh, as researchers, we use the full variety and range of tools. We use interviews, we use observations, we use surveys, we use a variety. But one of the tools we have used is experiments using virtual reality to try to get people to engage with a scenario. So in this scenario, um, this is quite prescient because we ran this just before the London underground bombings of 2005. And our scenario was a fire on the London underground station. And um, so the story begins, so people are settled at the scene and they're told, you hear somebody shout, there's a fire, get out, get out, right? And you tell the participant, you've only got a few minutes to get away. And so there's an animation of people running to get out. And in this, this is an experiment. And in experiments, what we do is we vary one variable, one condition. We change one thing and then measure the effects. And so what we changed was this level of identification, right? So in one condition, we implemented a high, high identification with the crowd. We said, you're part of a crowd um, of football fans of the same team. So you're with people in your group in this crowd. In the second condition, it was still a crowd, right? But this time there wasn't that identification. We said, you're amongst a crowd of shoppers. So it's not that you're identifying with them, you're just physically amongst them. And in this experiment, we were able to um, measure help. We had um, figures, characters that had fallen down and uh, the participants were able to lift them up, um, which will cost them a bit of time as it would in real life. But also they had the possibility of pushing people out of the way as they tried to escape. And we found that more help, more assistance was offered in the high identification condition and more pushing took place in the low identification condition, as one would expect. So um, let's go back to the question of how people behave um, uh, in emergencies. And um, people often talk about panic, of course, and you know, the, the concern that the crowd is gonna panic, leading to an even greater disaster. But all the evidence shows that the greatest threat to safety in emergencies, particularly those emergencies involving evacuation, is not overreaction, people responding too hastily, but underreaction, people delaying their evacuation. That is, the, that is the key issue. That is the thing that occurs most and is usually the biggest danger. So imagine, imagine you're, I know you're probably sitting in your homes right now rather than at work, but imagine you are at work and the alarm bell goes off. What are you gonna do? So I can't see your replies, of course, in this uh, format. But normally when I ask that to uh, a seminar, people sit there for a few seconds, looking up at me, right? Because that's how they behave in the real world, isn't it? The alarm goes off, you pause, right? Unless you're people who work in safety, right? And then you know that you should get out as quickly as possible. But most people will hesitate you know they will hesitate. Um, they'll often look around for other signals, right? What are other people doing? What are people um, who know better than me doing? Are they leaving, right? And there are a number of reasons why people delay their evacuation, why they hesitate. So the first one, and that relates to this problem here, is that people do not take the emergency seriously. They do not take the signals seriously. They do not interpret the signals as telling them that they are in danger and they hesitate. A second reason is, and this comes out, a lot of this work is on fires and David Cantor's work on fires is the classic uh, example. Another reason they delay actually getting out, as they should do, is to try to deal with the emergency. They go back and investigate the fire, try to fight the fire. You know, you're told, you know, if you're, like I am, I'm um, a, uh, a fire warden, and we're told as fire wardens, you don't try to combat the fire. You get everybody else out and you get out. But people try to do something about the fire or the other emergency. 
And the third reason that people delay their evacuation is to help other people, to stay with other people, to help them, um, to stay with people they care about. And that leads to delay as well. So people delay their evacuation um, a lot of the time, but not always, because of course we also know that people switch from underestimating risk to sometimes responding much more urgently, even um, to the extent that they respond to false positives, false alarms. Now, a few years ago, we saw an example of this, and again, it was kind of talked about in a very disparaging way in the press, unfortunately, as, as panic and contagion and so on, as a, uh, as a pathology in the public, um, when um, people in Oxford Street in December, in fact, this happened a couple of times in, in December in Oxford Street, in autumn in Oxford Street, they heard a sound, right? And then some of them started running, then others saw them running and they started running too, and loads of people got involved. So let's see if my video works. I just heard screaming and then a herd of people were just charging down. It looked like they were just, you know, it looked like they were being sort of mowed down, but that was just people running over each other, tripping over each other, like dropping their bags, throwing their things down. Everybody just started running towards me. Panic, chaos, absolute mental, yeah. So what can you do but to turn and run yourself, yeah? So um, 10 minutes later, it started again, but even worse. So that was just pandemonium. Nobody knew what was going on. So I'm going to stop that there. Um, so when do people switch from underestimating to, if you like, overestimating and reacting more promptly? In fact, doing what the government tell them, which is to run, run, and, uh, run and hide. Um, well, one reason we think uh, leads to the switch is the, um, the fact that there have been a number of genuine incidents beforehand. I mean, in, uh, in London in 2017, there had been three genuine terrorist attacks already that year. Um, and in the same year, in 2018, there were a number of similar incidents of people running to the sound of breaking bottles and all sorts of false alarms when there had been genuine uh, marauding gunmen attacks um, at events. So that um, leads people to recalibrate their, uh, their understanding of how much risk they face. So this tendency to underestimate risk is liable to change according to context. And just one final thing before we, we move on is you, you would have noticed, I hope you noticed in the video, that people weren't all running, they weren't all trampling. Some of them were walking, some of them were standing around, some of them were looking for more information. So quite a mixed response as well. So we know that people um, we know that people uh, delay their evacuation, but we know they attempt to flee. And they attempt to flee sometimes as individuals, but they very often attempt to flee, they attempt to evacuate in their groups. And I've got some examples on the slide there. Beverly Hills Supper Club fire, they attempted to leave in family groups. Summerland Leisure Complex, they attempted to leave in family groups. Station Nightclub fire, they attempted to leave in groups of friends. And later I'm going to show you people attempting to leave with groups of strangers. Now it's important, it's not just an academic point to, to, to say this, because I think when you make your plans about uh, your, your emergency response, you know, you need to know that people aren't necessarily trying to leave in single file. They will leave in groups. They will try to stay together. And that might slow them down, particularly when they've got now, within that group, you've got somebody who's a bit slower than uh, the rest of the group, like an elderly person or a person with a disability, that kind of thing. Now, one thing I want to uh, kind of draw out from what I said so far about how people behave in emergencies is whether it is, um, whether it is delaying their exit or making an exit, right, people very often cooperate with each other 
cooperation is very common in emergencies. Look at all the literature. One of the things that comes up again and again is that people cooperate, even in the most difficult of circumstances. And here are two uh, very difficult disasters where people were physically being crushed, and yet there were, you know, if, if you read the witness accounts, you know, we interview people at Hillsborough from Hillsborough, and Norris Johnson did a fantastic study of the Hugh, Hugh concert disaster. People tried to help each other. It's not everybody. It's not every disaster, that's true, but it is common enough that it is frequently commented upon in nearly every disaster that you read about. So as psychologists, um, we don't simply document this helping, this cooperation, this coordination that happens in many emergencies, this group behavior. We don't simply document it we want to understand the process how it, how and why it happens what's the mechanism right the reason for that the reason for spending so much time understanding mechanism and process is that if we can understand how it happens uh, we can not only develop theory but we can help inform people like yourselves people in the industry people in emergency response and you can use that knowledge in your management practices to enhance the good behaviors and minimize the less good behaviors again so if you look at the literature the literature tells you that there are two kinds of processes or mechanisms that explain why people tend to help each other or cooperate act in a groupy kind of way in emergencies the first is that people are already in groups People attend events in family groups, they attend events with their friends. And in the literature, that is called social capital. The bonds you have, the connections you have with other people, the embedded existing trust that you call upon in times of need. Right, lots of evidence for that. But the other thing, and I think this is the one that I, that I do most work on, and I think is also most relevant for you, um, is emergent groups which means that, um, just need to get rid of this poll result that's in my screen, um, there are also emergent groups, which means groups which are new, which arise from the event, right? Which relates to the point I said at the beginning, that groups can change, right? You can change from one group into another group. You can see yourself as part of a, a new group, depending on the context. So now let me tell you about research study that I was uh, I led that illustrates how this happens and it happens in quite a dramatic way. And it's our study of the uh, July 2005 London bombings. Now, as you probably remember, the bombings there were four of them: three on underground trains, one on the bus. It happened during rush hour in London. 56 people were killed, including the bombers, and over 700 people were injured. Now the situation for those affected um, was that they were, most of them were trapped underground for a period of time because the emergency services didn't, couldn't get to them all immediately. Um, and they were left in the dark literally and figuratively for a period of time. So in our study, what we did was we interviewed survivors and we got written accounts from survivors. We had dozens and dozens of, of accounts and we tried to look for patterns patterns in behavior and patterns in motivation and the first thing we did was to list well what did people do did they help how did they help um, what was the form of the helping and it was a variety of forms of help from emotional support in fact emotional support is really important in events like this um, so people were giving reassurance to each other sharing bottles of water it's not just a practical thing, it's, an, it's a form of emotional support, but they were physically helping each other, like putting people from the wreckage, supporting people as they evacuated, tying tourniquets. And you can see in the table, we divided this up in various ways. First of all, in the top row, you've got the types of evidence. And then in the, in the first column, you've got the way that people reported the help. So people said, people talked about the help they gave to others. They talked about the help they received from others and they talked about the help that they saw. So, you know, there might be some double counting here, but 
you can see however way you divide it up, <coughs> helping behaviour was much more common than selfish behaviour, which would include pushing others aside and ignoring their pleas for help. So that is that is a common finding. That is that is that has been found in many studies of disasters before. So as I say, we wanted to know why. It might be thought that because the bomb had already gone off, then um, people were not uh, didn't feel at risk, perhaps, and so there's no particular special explanation needed for why they helped. Um, there was no cost involved in helping others. That's objectively true. But if you think about the psychology of a uh, the experiencing a bombing, right? What you know from from uh, from um, from examining how people experience these events is it changes their their view of the world, right? So they will expect more catastrophe. And so the people we spoke to, they still felt in, the bomb had gone off, but they still felt in danger. So they talked about secondary devices. Would there be a secondary device? Would the tunnel collapse? If I step outside the train, will I step on an electric line? Will I be hit by an oncoming train? These were their fears. So basically, most of the people we spoke to, most of the people we heard from, felt that they were still in danger of death. And you can see that in the top two rows. Most people who talked about it said that they were, they still felt in danger for their lives. Very few people, people felt safe. And this is important because people were still helping even though they felt in danger of death. So then we looked at the question, of, well, who are you with? Right, because remember a few slides ago I said, one of the main reasons why people help, or one of the main explanations why, for why people help, is that they're in existing relationships, they're in existing groups, they're with family, they're with friends. And affiliates here, the word affiliates refers to those existing relationships. And you could see that most people who talked about it were with strangers, not with people they knew, because it was rush out. Right? These were basically commuters going on the way to work. And... So this is why people were not in family groups. They were not with groups of friends. They were with strangers, but still they helped other people. Why? So using our framework, we looked at how people talked about those they were with and whether that changed over time to become more group-like, if you wait, for, a, for an emergent psychological group a shared social identity to arise from the event which would then motivate this supportive behavior so when we asked people to talk about the people they were with in the moments before the bombing they talked in this kind of way uh, as in this example from one of our interviewees so he says what was the unity like i'd say the unity was very low with other people just three out of ten. I mean, you don't normally think about unity on a on a normal tube uh, journey. And if you can imagine, you know, you don't, do you? You're, you're you're like the people in the second photo. You know, your your eyes are down on your iPads. Uh, you're not and your phones. You're not looking at other people. You're not you're not feeling a, a bond with them. You just want to get from A to B, get a seat. And so the identity, the sense of self there, the psychology was a sense of me in relation to other individuals. That's essentially what it was. But then when we asked people to talk about their relationship with these same people immediately after the bombing, they talked in, in these ways. You can see on the slide, you can see a rich vocabulary of we-ness or being a, being a group. They talked about a unity, talked about being together, a similarity, an affinity, a part of a group. Everybody, it didn't matter what colour or nationality, you thought these people knew each other. So they behaved as if they were not strangers, as if they already knew each other. A teamness, a warmness, a vague, a vague solidity, an empathy. So now it was an us in relation to the bombing. So things had changed and a group had emerged from where there was previously no group. And when we looked at the numbers, now these numbers are small, but they are in line with our expectations that um, unity is a kind of proxy here for a way of talking about shared social identity and being a group. 
And you can see that many more people talked about unity and common fate than being, being together than talked about disunity or being untogether. Now this study and many others like it um, had different kinds of emergencies, earthquakes, floods, uh, the Hillsborough disaster, the Big Beach Boutique, which was not quite a disaster, but nearly a disaster, together have led us to put together a model um, which explains this process, explains how groups can arise in emergencies and lead to adaptive behaviour uh, that we call collective resilience. Um, first of all, there is a common fate, so people experience all being in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. That implies a we, a we where there is shared social identity. I see you as part of my group. I feel an affinity with you. We're in the same group. We share identity. That motivates me to care about what happens to you. It uh, also motivates routine civility of, of uh, for example, queuing, allowing others to go first, coordinating. Um, it leads us to expect support from others. They care about me because they're in my group. That gives me a sense of efficacy, which means my ability to act. So I'm not helpless. If others will back me up, I can act. So together we can remove the, the, tr uh, the train door in this carriage, which is jammed and get out because we can act together. We can coordinate. So all these things follow <coughs> from a shared social identity. So I mentioned the word resilience. And I want to dig to slightly here to talk about resilience in the official sense, because um, if you look at the UK government's guidance on community resilience, it's the name of a programme and it's a set of concepts around public involvement and participation, adaptive participation in, in disasters. And it's the complete opposite of panic, of course. Um, and they talk about communities because they say community resilience. So what do they mean by community? They mean different things, right? And they give the names of four types of community that can be resilient, right? And the first is geographical, you live together. The second is communities of interest, so you're in a club. And then you've got communities of supporters, so volunteers or flood wardens. But what's more interesting to me is uh, this one. Uh, it gets less attention and it gets less space in the guidance, but it is... I think something you recognise, and I recognise it, because it seems to be talking about what I've just been talking about. A community of circumstance is created, so it's not a pre-existing group, it's an emergent group, and it arises when people are affected by the same incident. And these people are unlikely to have the same interests or come from the same geographical, geographical area, but may form a community in the aftermath of an event. Although this sense of community may be temporary, some communities of circumstance grow and are sustained in the long term following an emergency. So the reason for telling you this is because so even at the highest level, this is recognised, this process I'm talking about is recognised. And what I'm giving you here is the underlying psychology, because you can see that this is a good thing. So how do we um, facilitate it? How do we help support? this kind of process when we need it and indeed how do we support it in more mundane situations and our in our events which are not actually going wrong but we still need that public cooperation so let me move on now to the third part of the webinar which is how how to use group psychology how to use these ideas to enhance safety at your events and um, i'm dividing this part of the uh, webinar into two of the conventional phases of, um, of disasters, which is preparedness and then response. So my first suggestion, uh, this is in relation to preparedness, is simply to know group psychology. Right, so if you go back to my, my earlier slides, my first few slides, and even my slides on how people behave in emergencies, Use that, know that, right? Know that so-called panic, people behaving in a disorderly way is actually uncommon within events and between events. Know that cooperation is more common in emergencies. And know also that shared social identity is the basis of much of that cooperation. 
right? So that is not an add-on. That should be fundamental, I think. And you know, why not include that in your guidance? Include it in your training, right? Make that a part of your work. My second uh, recommendation around preparedness is to communicate. We all seem to know this now. Everyone seems to agree, right? The information is good. Right? If you look at the official guidance from the government, the UK government, you know, communications right up there, information's right up there, right? There are information, public information campaigns. Um, it seems to be really important, but there is more to say. Because communication or good communication psychologically is more than just providing information. Who is providing that information? It really matters where that information comes from. As I said at the beginning, right, when people are in the same group, that's when they listen. That's when they trust the information. That's when they take your example. Right. So if you're seen to be not in the <laughs> not in the group, an outsider, then right, the the authorities that we dismiss, right, they're not going to listen. So it's about building that relationship, which I'll come on to. How do you how do you build that relationship? Well, still within preparedness, one of the ways you start to build the relationship is that you listen and learn. So many of you will have events at which you've got a regular clientele and you'll know this i'm kind of telling you what you already know but i'm kind of telling you i'm giving you the kind of psychological rationale for what your good practice get to know who they are right so we talk about um audience profile or crowd profile usually in the industry but here's a different way of talking about the same thing which is identity which i've already told you about and the other, other concept is the group norms. The group norms are the set of rules um, that structure behavior that a group shares. So if you look at this picture, um, you know, usually when I run this, I say, you know, put your hands up if you don't know, if you've never seen this before, right? And um, I can't see your hands, but you know, if you haven't seen this before, you might look at this and you say, well, this looks like an unruly event. An event which is disorderly, an event which is even violent, right? But you, if you're you work at events in which you have mosh pits, you know that there are rules which structure behaviour in these events. That people, <coughs> if you fall over, you get picked up. You don't punch people in the face. They've got rules. But it's the same for any uh, subcultural group group of fans that come to your event. They have values which are a function of their identities. They have rules which relate to who they are. They have needs and priorities which relate to who they are. So get to know them. You get to know through talking to them. You get to know through your scholarship. Get to know. That is the first step to building that relationship, to know who they are. Also in preparedness, in preparedness phase, um, use the words that you use to build that shared identity. Use language to build shared identity. Words matter. I've got on the slide here a nice example from somebody that uh, many of you will remember, Mick Upton, and his example was of the same personnel who were badged differently. So in one context, the personnel, the same personnel were badged as security. In another uh, context, the same personnel were badged as safety. And he found that people, the fans, the public responded very differently to the same personnel, depending on how they were badged, right? And there was much more friendly interaction, cooperation with the, with the staff badge of safety. Why is that? In our terms, the security personnel are possibly presented, are seen as other, as outgroup, that their function is to secure the venue, the location, whereas safety, it's they're, they're more likely to be seen as in-group. Their role, their function is to ensure our well-being. So that's one example. Let me give you another example of this. How do we go from them to us, right, with the, uh, uh, um, an event in which there are obviously at one level um, two groups, right? So you, 
you and your personnel have one role, and the fans who come to your event, the public, have another role. So obviously, these are two different groups um, at one level. But at another level, they are people who are at the same event, and they can be talked about, presented, thought about, and identify with a superordinate category. Yesterday, I was talking to uh, Morton, who is the head of security safety at Roskilde Festival in Denmark. And he said, I mean, this is his example of using, um, using language. He said, at his event, there are no guests, which means public and staff. They don't use these terms, right? Instead, everybody at the event is called a participant, right? So he uses language to create that sense that there's a we shared by staff and personnel. Another way of doing the same thing is to say, okay, well, you know, there are different groups here, but we're all part of the same family. There's a superordinate group. So let's move on to the response phase. That was, a, that was the preparedness phase. Let's move on to response phase. And again, <laughs> I'm gonna say the same thing, communicate. Communication is always important. Let me give you an example of why it helps. So this is a very nice experiment carried out by Gillian Proulx and uh, Jonathan Sine many years ago on Newcastle Metro, which is an underground light railway. Um, it's an experiment in which there's a, uh, an emergency evacuation and there are three conditions. And in the first condition, there's just an alarm bell goes off, which is the usual thing. So just an alarm bell. In the second condition, um, there's a PA, a public address announcement, telling people to get out, please leave the station. And in the third condition, there's the same public address announcement, please get out, but also this time, they told people there was a fire and they told people where the fire was um, and uh, asked them to leave. And so um, it was the third condition, as you might guess, which was the most efficient and effective for getting people out of that station. Now, I know from talking to Andy earlier that um, in an earlier webinar in this series, there was a discussion about what these kinds of ideas about communication and, you know, your relationship with, your, uh, with the public and with your people coming to your event means for traditional practices, such as the practice of using code words to communicate with each other about a, uh, a bomb or a fire, that kind of thing. So the question is, do you give up Mr. Sands? And I think most of you will know who Mr. Sands is. Do you give up your signaling? And my short answer to that is, it depends what you want to achieve, right? Because if you do want people to get out as quickly as possible, if that is what you want, you need them to get out and not to um, delay their exit like they normally do, then you need to give people a reason. You need to do, as Jonathan Sine did in his Newcastle Metro experiment, you need to let people know there is a danger. Right? You need to give them a reason to get out. If you don't give them a reason, they're going to stand around asking you why right? and delay. And that could cost lives. And I think, you know, my, uh, my thought about this is that you need to think about your relationship with your, with your, with your public, with your clients. Because if you are seen to withhold information, if people perceive there is a problem and you are perceived to withhold information, this damages the relationship they have with you. Right? It means they're less trusting of you. You're maybe not in group anymore. You're not part of us anymore. So that when you communicate other things, they're not going to listen. So that relationship is, is key. And I've tried to represent this in, a, in this figure. So at the top there, you've got there's a danger. People perceive there's a, there's a problem. Um, and then you know, the managers say, well, OK, we're worried about the crowd panicking, so we're not going to tell them um, what the danger is. Or we're going to withhold some of the information. That danger and withholding of information only increases the anxiety in the crowd. Information, lack of information increases anxiety, but it also increases or reduces the trust in the authorities, right? The result of that is <laughs> the authorities, the managers see the anxious crowd, they see the untrusting crowd, they say, well, look, uh, there's a panicky crowd, 
that proves we were right. So, um, so you go around the circle again. So it does damage the relationship and it is, because of that, it is counterproductive. So back to the, uh, back to the uh, uh, recommendations, uh, the response phase again. So how do you build identity within the response phase? Because here, time is, time is tight. Before, the, before an incident, in the preparedness phase, you've got your social media, you've got all the stuff you do leading up to the event, you can take your time, you can have Facebook pages, you can talk about group norms, you can do all these things to build that relationship. How do you build it within the event? Can you build it within the event? So here I want to tell you quite briefly about a, uh, a piece of research which was able to show how you can build identity with the public in a time critical incident within the incident itself. In fact, in a very difficult incident. And um, the, in the UK, um, a crisis we had last year, which by today's standards now seemed an extremely minor thing, was this, a chemical incident, in fact, a radiological incident, rather, um, in Salisbury in the west of England, which was part of an attempt to um, poison somebody. And this is a picture from, from Salisbury of, uh, these, are, these are fire and rescue personnel um, uh, carrying out some of the decontamination. And that is what I want to um, tell you briefly about. So in the event of a chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear incident, there is a procedure for dealing with that uh, in the public, so the public get a chemical incident on their clothes. And in fact, it's not just terrorists that do this, it could be an accident. And these days also, um, and this is relevant for those of you running clubs or have, have run clubs, you get um, acid attacks in the nighttime economy as well. So in each of these cases, there is a procedure. And the first part of that procedure is rather than encouraging people to leave the scene as you normally would with an emergency, you know, apart from the police, the, the rest of the <coughs> emergency services want people to get out straight away, clear away. You want them to stay there. You don't want them to go home to their family and spread the contaminant. But you also need to decontaminate people, right, to remove that contaminant. And contamination, decontamination itself can be much more stressful, distressing for the public than the acid attack or whatever it is, right? Because many, in many of these incidents, like a chemical incident, people don't uh, realise the, the, the danger they're in, right? So all they see is they're being asked to take their clothes off and uh, be showered in quite a, uh, a public way um, if you go for the full procedure. So it is an unusual procedure. You have to take your clothes off and you have to wash down your clothes, wash down your body, um, um, being uh, uh, managed by the emergency services. Um, and the issue with that is if people find it so distressing that they don't comply, then they do just uh, take, it, take the contaminant home to their families. Now imagine you have got an incident, right, and the fire service turn up, they haven't got the personnel to kind of properly police this and this is really an incident where you have to have public engagement you've got to have people wanting to actively uh, engage with this procedure for it to work right you can't rely on forced coercion shouting at people but traditionally that is what the fire service have done right they have hopes that people uh, engage with it and if they don't engage with it they shout at them right which is not not uh, not found to be useful so we uh, carried out some research. This is research led by Holly Carter at Public Health England. Um, we carried out some research to increase that public engagement and increase that active participation to make uh, decontamination more efficient, quicker um, uh, and, and better in the future. The reason for telling you about this is because this work gives you lessons, I think, for any uh, any uh, engagement that you need from the public. How do you get people to engage with something that they might not want to engage with? And of course, you know, this relates to the COVID-19, of course, where we, we have to do, there are many kinds of activities we, we're having to 
to engage with that we might, wouldn't normally want to, like distancing and so on. So just going back to this, this research, um, so what was introduced into the procedure used by the fire service is the role of communication. It sounds so simple, but they didn't have it. It was just, it was not a part of the procedure. It simply set up your, <coughs> set up your decontamination tent and you know, people would queue up or you shout at them. So we introduced a way of talking to the public in which um, the relationship was um, uh, foregrounded. So the communication must be open. It must be seen to be honest. It must be practical. It must show respect for people's concerns because people were concerned about privacy. So show concern for people's privacy uh, fears. You can't solve them all, but show that you care. So give emotional support. All of these factors, these, this thought given to communication led to a change in the way the procedure was viewed and experienced. So instead of being seen as this imposition, it was seen as being treated fairly. We're being treated fairly now. We're being treated legitimately. This is in our interests. That in turn changed the relationship between the responders and the public. So now the public saw the responders, despite their gas tight suits, they saw them as us. These are our experts now. These are our people. We're all in the same group. And that led the um, instructions of the responders to be trusted. And that in turn led to greater levels of compliance. So if you measure how quickly people go through this process, they start going through at the optimum time, which is there's an optimum time to, to clean yourself down and people started uh, uh, going through in that optimum time. So again, it's the relationship that is key and that relationship um, changed through the way that people communicated, the way that personnel communicated. So I know I've over, overran over uh, by about 10 minutes. I've got about two or three minutes left for the remaining slides just to let you know where I am. Um, my final recommendation <coughs> for the response phase is for those situations where it's so difficult that they're just not going to listen to you. And you all have had experience perhaps at an event where the culture is one where maybe they're a bit anti-authority, right? They're not going to listen to you at all. Um, you can be as open and honest as you like and they're still not going to listen to you. What do you do? So here the recommendation is to work with prototypical group members. A prototypical group member is one who, a group member who embodies the rest of the group. How do you know who's prototypical? How do you know who stands for the rest of the group in your audience? You listen and learn, right? You know who are the ones in the group which are the ones which are typical group members, the ones other members of that audience listen to and you work with them. Here's an example. So in 2002, we had an event here in Brighton, this is where I am, in Brighton, which was almost a disaster. And this is notorious now, or famous now, in the industry. The organisers advertised uh, a free beach party with um, Fatboy Slim and other international DJs, expecting, planning for 60,000 people and getting 250,000 people um, all at the same time on Brighton Beach, which is equivalent to the entire population of Brighton and Hove all at the same time. And so the emergency services, the safety group, the security personnel, all overwhelmed, all the safe space, all the uh, emergency exits overwhelmed. Um, a very dangerous event and also um, risky um, in a number of ways. As the tide came in, there was a risk of people uh, um, trying to evacuate and, and, and a possible crash. There were these people, you can see in the picture, somebody climbing up the, um, climbing up the lighting rigs, and this was seen as a day agent, not just to them, but to other people. There were a number of risks. And, and, uh, and, and in a second, I'm gonna show you how one of those risks was dealt with through using prototypes. I just wanna show you first a video if it works of I 
going to going to cut that short because I want to move on to the. Uh... Okay, so we've got the problem of people climbing up the lighting rigs. What are we doing, right? So you imagine if the police say get down, right? You've got a very powerful crowd there, right? You've got two hundred fifty thousand people. This is our event. This is a free event. You can't tell us what to do, right? If the police tell somebody to get down, what's going to happen? You're going to get even more people climbing up just because they can and to defy the cops. So this was a problem faced by the, the safety personnel. And so this is what one of the safety personnel says about how to resolve this. How are we going to get him down? So I said, you ask the voice of God, which is the DJ Fat Boy Slim, ask him to turn the music down and ask him to say very nicely, please get down because the party can't carry on until you're back down on the ground. But do it safely, please. And then because of the influence of the DJ, that will influence um, other people to encourage the person, the people to come down. And also because you've got this safety norm, he won't get his head kicked in. We're all friendly. We're all nice about this. And we'll also stop other people climbing up. So what happened was the music went down. Fat Boy Slim spoke. The person waved a bit. Everyone cheered him. And they're all cheering him down, down, down. He comes sliding all the way down. Everyone cheers and nobody climbed a lamppost for the rest of the night. So it was the knowledge of the organisers, the knowledge of the safety personnel, that Fat Boy Slim was the person that people would listen to, um, uh, brought back to a safe conclusion and enforced a, uh, a safety norm. So let me summarise my recommendations. My first recommendation is that you know group psychology, you use the ideas I've told you about in your training, the second is that you get to know your crowd's identities. What are their norms? What are their values? The third is that you build shared identity. You develop that relationship with them. You create a shared identity with them to get them to listen to you. Um, and fourth, within the event, you can the way you communicate and provide information and show respect also creates these connections, creates this shared identity that you need. And fifth, if they won't listen to you at all, then you use group prototypes for influence. And just, just before I finally finish, I think some people might want, uh, just in case people want more of this, here's some places where you can go for more. So um, this is the website of uh, Crowns and Identities, my research group. So find out more about what we're doing at this site. So you will be getting PDFs. At the end of this, PDFs will be available, so you can click on these links if you need to. Secondly, um, on another one of our websites, we've got lots of open access copies of our articles on a range of crowd related topics from all the way from riots to religious festivals. Third, one article I particularly like to draw your attention to is this article, which again is open access, which has been written specifically for practitioners, mostly for people in emergency response, but there's lots of stuff that is based on my dialogue with uh, people in the live events industry, and which is written for that audience too. And then finally, if you really like what I've been talking about and you find it useful, I do run two day events, um, two whole days of this stuff. Um, the next one scheduled is run by the Emergency Planning College in December, but there may well be others too. I've run them before at Safe Events in Ireland and a number of others. So that is me. That is my email if you want to get in touch and my Twitter handle. And now we've got about half an hour for questions. Thank you very much, John. Uh, that was really interesting, uh, as always. Uh, certainly, your work has, has played a big part in my career and, and planning a lot of events that I've been involved in. And uh, hopefully that introduction is really interesting to everybody else as well. Um, so we've got a number of questions to ask John. The first one's coming about, um, I think it's got a communication theme. So the question is, as most emergency exits uh, at temporary outdoor events by their nature will be unfamiliar to most participants and it's not often practical realistic uh, to do a drill with the public in the event setting how do we overcome the fact that they'll be so unfamiliar with where to exit in an emergency that's a really important question um, 
As I mentioned, uh, when I talked about the, uh, the tragedy at King's Cross in 1987, the reason that people died, one of the main reasons people died, was that they used the wrong, they used the wrong exits. And just to let you know that you know, drills are really effective and drills work. Um, uh, there were two evacuations, I don't know if you know this, there were two evacuations of the World Trade Center, one in 1993 and one in 2001. And the one in 1993 um, was because of a, uh, a, uh, a bomb in, a, in the basement and the evacuation took two and a half hours and was decided to be a bit inefficient, right? Because when the plane struck the World Trade Center in 2001, people had just two hours to get out from below where the plane struck. But they did. They got out in that two hours, and the reason they got out in that two hours was because they had drills that showed people where the doors were. So that tells you that drills are important, but of course, with live events, you've got people that are not there routinely. Presumably, you have the drills for your personnel. You have six monthly drills for your personnel. Um, and so your personnel, I mean, if you go back to King's Cross, you, you, you know, you'd have drills for the personnel, but you wouldn't have drills for the public. So what did they do that was different after 1987? And I think two things. One is the drills for the personnel. So the personnel are there to direct people. And the second one I'd recommend is that the signage is clear. I mean, I, I suppose this is kind of stating the obvious, but there's no easy answer to the question of getting people who are casual users of your venue to have that same level of knowledge that you get from drills. So the drills are for the people that work there and the signage is for the people that aren't work, aren't, who aren't working there, but you need the both so that the people who've been trained in the drills are, um, are a supplement to the signage and help people, direct people to those, uh, to those exits. Thanks. I think it's really interesting, that question, and it gets brought up a lot over the years at, at different events that we run. Um, and we've spoken in the past, when you look at events like uh, incidents that we all tend to use for training, like the Station Nightclub, for example, in, in America. And the video of the Station Nightclub um, starting to burn down also includes a, a, a part of it showing all the empty fire exits. So the, the human behaviour there, everybody's headed for the point of entry because nobody's given them an alternative. And there's a, a crowd collapse in the doorway yeah. and people can't get up because nobody has communicated no one's given that information now we've also sort of highlighted what's the first thing that happens when you get on a plane the first thing that get on the happens when you, you're getting on your plane and you're about to take off on holiday or or commute is they tell you where the exits are they, they play you a video the, the stewardesses or stewards stand up and and direct you to the exits now th this was i don't know if anyone's seen it this was um trialled by Emirates cabin crew in a stadium, I think it was in Barcelona, where they did a similar thing. They stood on the pitch in, uh, before a match and, and pretended to point to all the exits. And there's been this argument over the years, of why don't we do this at the start of concerts? Why don't we have some kind of safety video that demonstrates where the exits are? I know you probably wouldn't be able to do it in a temporary event, but certainly stadiums where you've got um, fixed infrastructure that doesn't change why is that not done and that's always been a question i can't get my head around certainly at our events that we do now we're, we're trying to do it we, we did it at our crowd safety conference back in birmingham a few years ago where we got chris akabusi to be the this said steward uh, which was quite interesting but yeah it's, 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 communication is really key to this so okay then the next question um do you see different group responses in different countries and are different cultural norms uh, which influence how a group behaves? Thank you. Um, that's a question I get asked a lot, um, particularly in relation to emergencies. So in psychology, there's the idea of collectivist versus individualist cultures, and that's a little bit misunderstood. So I'll say a few words about that. So collectivist cultures are cultures like India and China, uh, other places in Asia, um, and individualist cultures are places like the United States, United Kingdom. Um, and what that means is maybe tradition is stronger there, family bonds are stronger there. It doesn't necessarily mean, however, 
that people are more groupy, right? Because in fact, the groupiness of, um, and therefore the attachment to the norms of that particular group in uh, India, China, and, uh, and other places, Japan, is, uh, is quite narrow, right? Um, and which means it is stronger as well, which means that people um, arguably are less able to switch, to shift, to a, uh, a more superordinate group, right? Because the bond is so strong. We think of America, I mean, if you're crude about it, you might say, well, America is very individualistic and therefore you might not expect the solidarity that you'd need in an emergency, but that's not, that's patently not the case, right? So in America, I think it is because, and this is my suggestion, because you haven't got those such small group bonds, the, the small group bonds are not quite so strong. So people are a bit more flexible with the groups they can identify with. They can shift from the family to the workplace to the gig identity. Then people can shift more easily to that emergent group that's needed in an emergency. And um, I mean, one of the best accounts, I mean, there's many, many good accounts of uh, the World Trade Center evacuation out there. So, you know, do have a look, just do a Google search. There's tons of excellent research. But one I'd like to draw your attention to is a chapter in the book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell, because she describes not only the evacuation down the stairs of the world of the two buildings, but in addition, the evacuation across the city, because people were moving across the city at that time, because I suppose you know, the, the city felt under attack. And people uh, coordinated spontaneously. And this is all um, the public, you know, organising themselves, right? It, this wasn't directed. Um, this was absolutely staggering, the level of coordination, the level of cooperation, um, which just shows you, I think, that, you know, it, an individualist culture does not mean, um, so, you know, that those are norms about the value of the individual, about, you know, self-determination and so on, personal interest, trumping, collective interest. But when it comes to something like an emergency, which shifts your focus from you alone to the wider group, uh, a place like America with those strong individualistic norms can still, uh, can still change. So there is a place for norms, in, and, uh, but they interact with um, changes. Uh, sorry, there is a place for cultural differences in norms, but they also interact with this self-process and by self-process i mean the human capacity to shift from the me and the i and the groups you're already committed to to new groups uh, new groups arise um, in emergencies and disasters i suppose for more mundane more mundane contexts yeah of course there are um there are cultural uh cultural differences in norms but you've also got your, your subgroup norms, your subculture norms, the norms for your groups at your particular events. I mean, you know, you've got clubbing culture norms, for example, and those clubbing culture norms are universal, aren't they? They're, you know, you see the same things around the world, right? Whereas you've got you know, you know, a metal gig norms, they're kind of universal as well. So across different countries, you'll get, uh, you'll get similar norms determined by people's commitment to particular subcultures and particular genres of music as well. Okay, thanks, John. And how do those cultural norms differ um, when people are, say, take the Hajj, for example, and there's a, a religious state of mind as opposed to uh, a state of mind where someone's going to a football match or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, some of you might know that um, I've done some research, well, not me personally, it's quite difficult to research the, the Hajj um, and you'll see that most of the research done on the Hajj is by engineers from the based and uh, computer scientists mostly based in the in the Middle East rather than people like me but our research was led by my PhD student who was a uh, a, a colonel in the civil defense and able to get access and um, one of the things known about the Hajj is of course the Hajj is a one of the five pillars of Islam, right? Which means that it has particular value around a set of universal 
norms and uh, aspirations, um, values, um, what it means to be a Muslim, right? And what it means to be a Muslim at Hajj is to be uh, um, uh, cooperative and to be harmonious with your fellow pilgrims, right? So no arguing and so on. So there's a universal, there's a universal value that whatever your country you come from, because remember that you know, Islam is all around the world and very different uh, countries with very different cultures um, uh, are Islamic. So that's universal. But then when you find, when you look at how people behave at, at the Hajj, within that you've got cultural groups and they, those cultural groups keep alive their, their values, their, their, their interpretation of Islam. Um, for example, if you're a Shia Muslim, you will have a, a value or a norm of trying to carry out your prayer um, uh, in the open air, right? So when you do your, your prayer at the Holy Mosque, you need to be in a place where you, you're not got the roof over you because there, there is a, there's a roofed area and an unroofed area. Um, and then there's the Indonesians, Indonesians, uh, at the at the at the Hajj, always um, uh, sort of link arms and and go around and do the tawaf, which is the circumambulation of the of the Kaaba in groups, right? So so you got you got the two levels there. You got the superordinate group, is we're all we're all Muslim, and you get you know if you inter we interview people, you get a strong sense of unity and uh, and so on. But within that, you've also got cultural differences, and it's a further thing, which is those people. At the event, who define, uh, uh, who who see the um, who see what it means to be Muslim in, in a in a broader way, are the ones that feel more identification with the rest of the crowd and more um, pleasure from being in the crowd, whereas those who define what it means to be Muslim in a more in a more narrow way, a more orthodox way perhaps, are the ones that don't see those around them as um, such good Muslims so much and I don't feel so much unity with them. So in answer to your question Andy, so it's a great question because it's such a nice um, case to look at. There are different levels, so at one level people are all one, but another level and particularly depending upon the specific ritual, because these things come out in the rituals, right, because different groups have different uh, needs in regard to rituals, then at another level um, we are different groups with our different needs and our different norms. Brilliant. Thanks for that, John. Uh, next question. Um, it, it comes from uh, from Walter. If you are the first event to open after uh, COVID-19 uh, for the public, what needs to be done to reassure attendees so they have that feeling that they are safe? Well, that's a really uh, important question right now. And I think it's not just a question for events, is it? I think it's a question for all of us and anybody with a an organisation, say an institution, a workplace, all of them need that, need to know the answer to that. How do you reassure people? And I think part of reassurance, and you'll see this in you know, some of the discussions that the scientific advisory groups are working on right now, part of that reassurance comes from the belief in the efficacy of the measures, right? So if you think of um, tracking and tracing, right? Are people going to engage with that is it going to help? Well, part of the um, answer to that question is whether people believe it's, it works, it's efficacious, and people might be willing to make sacrifices if they believe it works. I mean, the same thing occurs for all the things we're doing now, right? We are willing to make these sacrifices in terms of social distancing if we think it works, right? So the first thing is, when you reopen, what are you doing? Right, so it won't be the same. Say you're opening in, I don't know, uh, January next year, right? And there's still no vaccine, right? That means there's still going to have to be uh, changes, you know, still going to be the new world rather than the old world, right? What are the things that you're doing? Are the things you're doing in line with the government recommendations? Are the government recommendations generally seen as effective? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is communicating that. So it's to be seen to be doing the things that are effective. Secondly, communicating those so that people know that you are doing the things that are effective, right? 
then they're going to feel reassured. And of course, all of that, the communication of what you're doing, um, the reassurance all hinges on your good relationship and it cuts two ways, right? Which means to say, if you've already got a relationship of trust with your audience, you know, that is your, that's, you use that, you know, that's your credits that you use when you communicate. But it cuts both ways because of course, the, um, your efficiency, your efficacy, your ability to do these things well, also builds that good relationship, right? And it will uh, maintain and enhance that, that trust that you, you, are, you are relying on. So yeah, the short answer is it depends what you're doing. So I think once you know what you're doing, then it's communicating what it is, communicating that it works. You've got the same problem that the government have got, right? So, uh, you know, it's communicating what works, communicating how it works, um, getting that trust. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next question. So you've talked about using a uh, study using virtual reality for evacuations. Are you aware of any studies that uh, use virtual reality um, for staff at a venue or event response um, to, I guess, to model evacuation of uh, any other venues, sort of entertainment related? Imagine well, yeah, I mean, there's in, Enrico, some of you might have heard of Enrico Ronchi. He's a um, fire researcher in, uh, he's based in Lund, Sweden. And he is the world's leading expert, I would say, on using virtual reality. I mean, his, his work is more advanced than mine. There's a, whole, there's a lot of people using it now. Um, but, you know, he, he is one name that comes to mind. So, you know, look him up, Enrico Ronchi, and look up his work. Um, it's on all sorts of buildings um, um, and it's you know, mostly on fires, but it's on other kinds of other kinds of issues as well. Wayfaring, they do it on. Um, there's lots of work out there now. I suppose in the last in the last five, ten years, you know, my work using virtual reality is quite old now. But in the last five, ten years, there's been lots of lots of really great stuff. And yes, yeah, they're not usually psychologists. You'll, you'll mo mostly find it in the pedestrian, pedestrian movement literature, the fire literature. Um, but yeah, there is a lot out there now. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, with the rise of everybody posting information on incidents on social media, so we've certainly seen this with the, uh, the Manchester Arena and various other places, um, people don't evacuate first. They start to stream it to YouTube or, or to Twitter or to Facebook um, before they even think about um, evacuating. So the question is, um, is it worth including social media channels in emergency communication plans? Well, yeah, let me talk a bit about you know, why it is that people do this first. Um, I think part of it relates to general responses. And this is kind of, well, it's not my work. This is old work. I mean, then David Cantor, you know, if you want to look further into this, I'd, I'd recommend the work of David Cantor, which is on fires. And it's the same kind of issue that people are, um, people underestimate uh, the way that fire moves and how fire kills you, right? Because fire moves very quickly. Um, you get killed by the fumes before the fire itself. You don't have to be smelling or seeing the fire for it to be a great danger, right? And um, I think fire researchers would say that one of the reasons that people are so underestimating risk so much in the case of fire is that we're so unfamiliar with it. Right. So years and years ago, people would know the qualities of fire today. They don't know the qualities of fire. And so they will take pictures because they don't think they're in danger. Um, they will do they, all those kinds of things. Short answer to question. Yeah, I guess so. Um, anything that anything that uh, that communicates with people, people do use their phone so much now. So I would say yes. But I think my interest really is in that kind of educational thing, I suppose that you know people do need to understand that fire is how dangerous fire is and we as a you know you as an industry me as a psychologist we need to help educate people about how to respond to risk right that you know it's better to look a bit stupid to uh to have a false positive than a false negative because a false negative is uh very dangerous it's where you 
there's a, there's a danger and you dismiss it. Better to there be no danger and you get out than the other way around. Um, uh, so I think you know, I think the, the key thing here for me is that is that perception, education, risk, understanding issue. But yes, I agree that any any uh, medium should be used to communicate in in real time too. Thank you, John. Um, next question. Uh, we're starting to get some sort of COVID nineteen related um, questions now. Uh, an emerging challenge may be to achieve voluntary compliance with COVID related safety measures as we start to open events again. Have you any advice on this on how we can communicate this to people coming to the events? Yeah, it's a really important point again. Um, so if we're assuming that you know the kind of advice we're talking about here revolves around distancing and the need to create space around people and importantly minimize the time that people are in proximity to each other because of course as many of you will probably know right the most risk comes from time spent together with people so it's not just it's not just the fleeting moments in the street so much it's more if you're spending 15 minutes or more in close interaction with someone that is the where the danger lies because people can be non uh, non-symptomatic and still spread spread the germs and so on um, so um, I think there have been two kinds of ways. If you look at the way that governments have, have uh, tried to implement, there have been two kinds of approaches. The one is letting people know what they need to do, and the other one is saying there's, these are actually regulations and laws. But what I notice um, is that, in fact, the, although the, the number of police fines has got a lot of publicity, it's actually quite low. And that tells you two things. It tells you that there is very strong compliance and very strong adherence to social distancing. I mean, most of the measures, whether it's people using Google Maps or whether it's people using public transport, or whether it's self-report, is 86%. And what I notice is that people were very much adopting many of these behaviours before the government said, we're, this is the law, this is the, these are the rules now, right? So that tells you something, right? It tells you that if you get the right engagement, if people firstly believe that they are at risk and secondly believe that the measures help, then they will engage, right? And that applies to your situation in the industry too, right? So how do you get people to believe that the measures work engage and listen uh, listen to your advice so it comes back to the same thing doesn't it it comes back to relationship right it comes back to being a, a trusted source and the the measures that you're um, advising that you're that you need people to adhere to are the measures that they know work from other sources so it's got to be in line with what the government is saying because if you're saying something different than what the government is saying then there's inconsistency and that's going to be challenged and that's going to undermine trust so it needs to be measures that are trusted you need to be trusted um, people need to know that those measures work thanks so, so, so what you're saying about building trust um one thing we've, we've used at a lot of events over the years is building the engagement through social media would you recommend that in advance of the event Oh yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I know lots of people running events do this now. So to take to take a, an example from you know uh, the old reality, right? So think of Ross Kilder. They they wanted to okay, they wanted to have this kind of sense of uh, uh, unity and um, uh, shared identity, but they also wanted certain rules about what it is we do and right and some things that we don't do, right? And that would include crowd surfing right so crowd surfing is not allowed not welcome how do we um how do we turn that into a, a into a thing that people believe in adopt um comply with right and their social media campaign is is one of the ways that, that events do that right i mean if you think of the, the facilities that social media give you right? one thing that facebook gives you that twitter doesn't give you for example is facebook gives you groups if you set up a Facebook group or a Facebook page, it allows 
the event organizer to talk about the we and the us, to talk about the things that we do, to have pictures of the things that we do, to have messages about the things that we don't do, um, for then your um, audience to chip in with that, right? To reinforce those norms by saying, yeah, we don't do those, or yeah, these are things we do, to share their pictures, but you also manage that page. So if there's anybody who's, um, who's out of line with that, then, you know, that can be managed. Um, so of course, I think, you know, for an event where you've got a, an expected audience or a ticket event, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the best ways of, 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 of sharing those, of sharing and promoting those, those norms and values. I want to say one more thing about, about distancing though, because there's a, there's a fundamental psychology of this as, as, as well as all the stuff we're talking about, about um, your, uh, your, your role, the role of management in this. There's a fundamental psychology here. Um, I mean, we, we used to say, we used to talk years ago about personal space and uh, crowding and people don't like crowding. You know, you want to maintain your personal space. Now that we've got social distancing, you can see the complete opposite because now we realise that actually what we miss, one of the things we miss most is closeness, is physical closeness. And, you know, this is something we, we've been researching for 10 years, right? So where people are psychologically close, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's an us, a we, whether it's your, your group, people you don't even know, right? What we know from the research is that people seek to get physically close. They seek to create shared psychological space. It's almost, you know, what it is to be human is to be close. So what does that mean for us and how we manage that in these new times, right? So I would say we have to draw on another principle from the psychology of the self and psychology of groups, which is the idea of, of social norms and tying norms to our sense of self. So we um, are a group and who we are are people that value public health. We value safety. We value others' well-being. We care about others. And because we care about others, therefore, we have to maintain distance, right? So therefore, when we maintain distance, right, we are acting in line with our motivations as, as group members, right? Because what it is to be a group member is to comply with the group norms. And the group norms here are all about public health and safety. This is what we do, right? So that makes it easier because it is hard. It is hard and it does feel unnatural, but you can make it more natural. You can make it easier if you present it and people experience it in as something in line with, as a function of their group identity. This is an identity congruent behavior. This is a value that we share. This is why we do it. Thanks, John. I think, I think you've kind of answered the next, next question there as well, which was, is there an expectation on how people will behave and react when after a long time, um, gatherings are now being held and, and events being held when they haven't been held for a long time. Um, and people are trying to sort of keep 1.5 metres away from each other. But I think you've, you've just sort of... Yeah, just to add one um, thing to that is when people ask me about how people behave, they sometimes want kind of what you might call universal answers. Like people always behave... People, you know, think of emergencies. How do people behave? Well, they always behave in a selfish way or they always behave in a cooperative way. I think one message I, I'm trying to communicate is here is that people behave in all sorts of ways. Like human nature is whatever people do, right? What I give you are the variables. So although there is a tendency, right, to try to be close to people you're, try to be physically close to people you're psychologically close to, right, and to perhaps be less close to people you're not psychologically close to, um, that is a tendency, and there's another tendency, another variable, which is social norms. What are the social norms? What is the content of the social norm? If you've got a social norm of closeness, then you're going to be close. If you've got a social norm of public health and distancing, then you're going to be distant, right? The more that you care about the identity and the more you conform to the norm. 
Um, so there is no short answer to the question of how people behave, except to say how people are going to behave when, you know, when, when lockdown ends, except to say it depends. And it depends very much on whether you can communicate those norms and people take those norms up and internalise those norms as our norms. And they've got to be new norms now because the old, the, work, the norms of the old world, uh, we need new ones. Brilliant. I know we discussed it earlier, but, and you, you just mentioned it then. It depends on how people behave once they start getting drunk or, or various other things at an event, how they're going to behave. Because your typical uh, festival goer or um, a concert goer wouldn't stand so close to somebody else in the street but they'll stand next to a complete stranger in their personal space at a concert for five, six hours in, in the sun. Yeah, one quick thing about that is um, one concept I haven't talked about today, but you know, I talk about in the main course, if you ever come to that, is um, about collective self-regulation, right? Um, because in many events, and I think the, the Fat Boy Slim uh, Big Beach Boutique, one I talked about earlier, is a very good example of this. I mean, that was completely unmanageable by the by the authorities, by the emergency services, by the crowd safety, completely unmanaged, right? And people talked about how they managed those annoying drunks. They did manage the annoying drunks, right? Um, how do they manage them, right? Well, they have to feel that they have the confidence, which means they have the support, the potential support of others in the crowd for interventions. And by interventions, I don't mean something forceful because at Fat Boy Slim, they use their social skills, you know, as any uh, any uh, member of your personnel would, they use their social skills to diffuse the situation, right? So, and, but in order to do that, you have to have that 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 shared identity, so that people do feel that when they intervene, other strangers will back them up. I think collective self-regulation is a, is a key to normal events in normal times, and it's probably going to be a key in in, in new times as well, because even you know, even when we're used to new times, say, you know, say a year down the line when, um, you know, the, the, the events have been going for six months, say, right? Even then, there'll be, uh, there'll be regulations, right? There'll be the new, it'll be the new world. And you're going to have to rely. You can't police every individual. You're not going to do that. You never did that before. You're not going to do it now. You're not going to do it in the future. You're going to rely on collective self-regulation and you're going to have to facilitate that. You're going to have to support that in your members of the public so that they regulate others and regulate their space at your events. That's my thought. And that would certainly be interesting to see how that sort of pans out and whether there will be some um, people at events who are slightly overzealous at that self-policing of, of distancing, which could then in turn cause some issues for the event security team, the crowd safety team, by people and maybe having a drink and then overreacting slightly because someone came a little bit too close. Uh, it'd certainly be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, the next question is, when you have a multitude of nationalities um, and lots of different languages and different interpretations of signage, how do you create social identity? Uh, for the example being used is Expo Dubai. What's the example, sorry? Uh, Expo Dubai. Uh, was Dubai 2020, but no longer that. Oh. There's millions of people coming together over a, a period of months. Yeah, I suppose um, people who run events at which they have like a global gathering of uh, participants uh, have got the same problem, haven't they? Of how do we get everybody to um, to work with the the norms that we have? um to see us the uh, the managers and authorities as the people that they would listen to um and i guess it is in the messaging so if you have got multiple language maybe at the Hajj, they have you know they've got that's a global gathering they have uh, all the languages are represented and they use we talk i mean i didn't mention that in my presentation but it's a simple thing right when you are addressing your uh, your public, your members of, the, members of the public, you're talking about a we and an us. It's a simple thing, but it actually helps, right? And you're doing that, okay, you've got multiple, uh, you've got signage in multiple languages, in multiple languages, and all of that, all of those languages are referring to an us and a we. 
it's a simple thing. And in terms of your, your staff, your personnel, um, they're able to use uh, body language to create connections. Um, so I mean, there are lots of techniques um, um, that are used successfully to, uh, to get that connection both um, in, within the audience and between the audience and the staff. So how much time have we got, Andy? Uh, we've got another sort of five minutes. We've got a few more questions, um, if that's all right. Um, we, uh, Billy mentions he, he's been a, uh, a CBRN uh, responder for the police. And certainly um, part of the, of the issue is how long decontamination takes and communication and relationships are key. You, know, you, you were speaking about the CBRN earlier. Yeah, what's uh, the question? Uh, I think it's more of a statement saying that communication and relationships were key to that process. Yeah. To, to what was happening. There. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think you know, the point I'm trying to make is you think it's difficult, but actually it can be done very quickly if you use the right words. Um, or that relationship can be improved from like no relationship at all to suddenly, oh, yeah, there are, they, these are our experts, these are our responders, which then you know, shifts the motivations of people. Yeah. Next question. Uh, I think this is um, reading the message. I think it's, with the differences of uh, safety officers' opinions across the industry in the use of safety messages and the use of code words at venues and events, is there any guidance or best practice available from studies on emergency messaging communication events that can be shared across? Uh, I think it's the Football Safety Officers Association. Yeah, I'm not really. I'm not really aware of that. I mean, the examples I've given you. Um, I know the, the only uh, ones I know of are the examples I've given you. I, I'm, I'm not aware of any systematic study. I mean, it's, it would be a good idea for a piece of research to actually do that, um, to do that. But as, as I said, I think when I had the slide on that earlier, what I was trying to do was to say there is no yes or no answer to whether you keep with Mr. Sands or abandon Mr. Sands, right? Because it really depends on what you're trying to do. If you do want to get people to get out, you need to tell them why, because it will help them. It will motivate them to get out more quickly. If you've got, you know, a suspect thing that is only suspect and you don't need people to move yet, then, yeah, you do need a way of communicating with each other, which doesn't uh, raise people's concerns unnecessarily. So um, the whole thing, you know, is, this is not, I've not presented an argument to say abandon code words completely. I'm, I've made an argument that, it depends what you're trying to achieve and you know, pr underneath all of it is prioritizing relationship issues as well. Definitely, certainly from my point of view, I mean, the example of Mr. Sands, everybody knows what it means anyway these days, so it kind of makes you ask the question why use it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, are there any good resources that can be used to find out more about norms, needs and requirements of people from different cultures? Uh, well, I think I, I, I suggest you have a look at um, some of the readings I mentioned in the slides earlier um, um, to see. It's not so much information about particular cultures. This isn't kind of anthropology. This is psychology, right? So I'm giving you generic concepts. So what I'm saying is there are different norms and this is how norms work. And if you look at some of our some of the papers that I sent links for earlier in the slides, you will see, you know, the, the norms of a of, of a rioting crowd, the norms of a, a crowd at a religious festival, the norms of a crowd at uh, St. Patrick's Day festival, you know, they've all got their norms, right, and, you know, there's some very good psychology on the way that those norms work to structure behaviour and to allow people to regulate each other. Um, so I'd suggest, you know, you, you have a look at those, a lot of open access ones now, um, and take it from there. Okay, so next one's an interesting question, it's, and I'm going to change it slightly. Is there any sort of techniques that we recommended or communication to help to calm down the crowd who have been facing poverty, marginalisation from the past, and now unable to go back home due to lockdown conditions? Yeah, I'm not sure when you say calm down. I don't, I don't know. I think uh, I understand why people are angry. I understand why people are distressed. I think these are the, when I speak to people, this is a bit anecdotal really, but when I speak to people, um, a lot of people, um, particularly though, you know, if you think of people who are uh, at home with a kid on their own or 
people that are kind of digit digitally disenfranchised, um, people losing their jobs, they're upset, they're angry. I understand why they are. I don't know about calming them down, really. I don't know. I understand why people are upset. Um, so I'm not sure that's answering your question. <laughs> I, do, I, understand the, I understand the emotions that people have. And I think, you know, just a sort of side issue, maybe, that we sometimes in you know, everyday talk, we sometimes link emotions with you know, being, people being out of control. But I don't think that's right, the right way to think of emotions. I think emotions are always linked with cognition, which means thought. Right, so when people get angry, right, it's usually around the transgression of something normative. So there's something, some kind of injustice that they're angry about, and the anger is a kind of motivation to try to do something about it. Um, I think the most dysfunctional emotion, if you want to talk about emotions in that way, which I normally don't, would be um, the more kind of passive depression, because depression kind of turns that anger inwards and leads the person rather than to act to change change the situation in a, in, a, in a constructive way to simply accept it and to feel bad about it so you know i think you know emotions you know we know from events in general that emotions are great we work with emotions you know atmosphere is about emotions um so i wouldn't you know i understand why people are angry and upset um i'm not sure about changing that you know turning it into action but, you know, people are often doing that anyway. Um, so those are my thoughts on that. I suppose it comes down to sort of any kind of conflict, doesn't it? Or any anger in something. It all starts with a frustration. And there is some massive frustration around the world at the moment. And people can't go to work or they can't see loved ones and they can't, they can't see family members. So that frustration yeah. is going to keep building until the, the relevant governments give more information and, and yeah. trying to pee, pee that frustration, I guess yeah um and i think this is probably our last question um what can we do about information fatigue thinking about more the covid thing rather than a full-blown emergency information fatigue yeah what's meant by that because in a way you know, the, the, the uk government say the same you know i listen to their you know their their announcement every day and they say the same thing a lot of the time i, I don't know about information fatigue but well, i will say something about fatigue i had a slide earlier i don't know if you noticed i forgot to mention what was going on there but um early on in the uh crisis the cmo the chief medical officer said one of the reasons we're not introducing social distancing regulations now we're leaving it is because the public will get fatigued right and then um, this was seized upon because people said, oh, look, the psychologists are to blame for delaying these measures that are needed because it was assumed that this idea of fatigue came from psychologists because psychologists are amongst the advisory groups advising the SAGE and the government. And then it was discovered that, and this is a newspaper article a, a week or two ago, it was discovered that the CMO had made this up. It was uh, a kind of a concept from his own experience and common sense. And it wasn't something that came from the, the, the psychologists at all. And what that tells you is that, as I said at the very beginning, right, even if you think you're not using psychology, you probably are, right, and you're using it from folk psychology, from everyday popular psychology, and it might not be very well evidenced because in fact that fatigue concept there's no evidence for that right <laughs> and yet that was used in a very important and consequential way which could be extremely damaging um so again you know it makes the point of you know, the rationale for this whole session is if you don't use this psychology you're going to use some other psychology and it's better that you use the psychology that's well researched rather than you know just what we hope, just how we think people behave. Thanks, and thanks, John. And you t you're totally right. The briefings that go on in the UK at the moment, at each day on TV, uh, I've stopped watching them now because they're just, like you say, they're either the same information or, yes, they, they give statistics, but the statistics are very similar. And Sky News send us updates every five seconds on the smartphone about these statistics. So we're hearing it all day and they don't really change what what they're telling people so 
I think people are starting to switch off to it, which could obviously be dangerous as well. For that. So thank you very much, John. That's, that's the last question um, for today. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. It's, um, it's really good of you to, to give up your time and to come along. Um, massive thanks to, to John for doing this. Um, for those of you who are interested, you should have received information on some of our next webinars. There's uh, another one next week uh, with Josh Rayner from What Three Words, who I'm going to be discussing with him various ways that app can be used to increase crowd safety, which is quite interesting. I did had a run through with it yesterday, and although I've used it in a, a little bit in the past, it's uh, there's quite a bit of functionality that could be useful there. Um, lots more webinars being planned. There's lots coming up um, that we haven't announced yet. We we don't want the information fatigue and boring people with uh, releasing too much at once. Uh, but we will keep telling you about that. Um, those of you who haven't signed up to the Crowd Magazine, please do. Um, they, they're now paying for us to upgrade the webinar uh, so we can have lots more people on it. Thanks very much, everyone. Any questions, feel free to email us and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you.